So, you know, all the sweet sins of the flesh, nearly always the imagination wins over the will. So what we need to do is to seek for the renewal of our mind. It says in Romans 2, Romans 12 verse 2, Do not be conformed to the things of this world, but seek for the renewal of your mind, that you may know the perfect will of God. You see, we need to put on the mind of Christ, because there are thoughts coming into our mind every day that are not from God. And I'd like to mention a few of them, because I'm sure you know them and you'll be able to take them on. Excuse me. Now, listen to a few of these. Not one of these is from God. Fear, phobia, panic, hurt, rejection, poor self-image, basic insecurity, self Condemnation, self-destruction, self-pity, pride, guilt, lust, scruples, doubt, anger, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, regret, jealousy, intemperance, confusion, despair, depression, occult, envy, anxiety, calumny, detraction, sloth. No, not one of those is from God, and that's just a few of them. Not one of those is from God. What the Spirit of God brings is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. St. Paul says, you must make every thought captive. We can't stop these thoughts coming in, but when they do, we can strangle them at birth, we can cast them out. We don't have to think it if we don't want to. It's our choice. So this is where it lies. The battle is fought and won or lost in the mind. So this is why we have to seek for the renewal of our mind, to put on the mind of Christ, so that we will see things through His eyes. And when we do, then we will love with His love, and we'll do what He wants us to do. So the mind is the battlefield. So this is what we have to look for, a renewal of our mind, that God will give us the strength, the mental strength, when things come in that shouldn't be there, to keep them out again. So, He also said, you know, that Christ is standing at the door knocking. That our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and the evil spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Ephesians you know, 6 verse 10. So this is what we're fighting all the time. Jesus came to give us abundant life. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. He came to give us the peace that passes all understanding. My peace I give you, my peace I leave to you. Not the peace that the world gives, but the peace that passes all understanding. And joy, the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength and my stronghold. Most people who are depressed have lost the joy. And when you lose the joy, you lose the strength. And when you lose the strength, you can't resist the devil and he won't flee. The joy of the Lord comes next to love in the fruit of the Spirit, and it's by the fruit you shall know them. Now, if we ever to try and figure out how many people were Christians by the joy that I see in their faces, I'd be way out in my estimates, I can tell you. As most Christians, and Catholics especially, are going wrong with long faces, like accidents looking for somewhere to happen. <laughs> and it's terrible. And you go into a charismatic meeting and say, Give me joy in my heart. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's very sad. I'm serious. It's, it's no joy. You know? So we need we need the joy. And sometimes we may even have to jump for it. Jump for joy. In order to get it. We need the joy. Jesus said, John 15, 11, you know, the joy with the joy I have told you these things. He says, As the Father loved me, so I, so have I loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. I have told you these things that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus wants us to have that. Philippians 4, verse 4. First of all, the first, the first quotation, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now that's Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your forbearance be known to men. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, 
And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will of Father, rejoice always, pray constantly, in all things give thanks. This is the will of the Father in Christ Jesus concerning you. So God wants us to have this joy. Psalm 51 verse 12, listen to this one. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. We don't have the joy of salvation in our own hearts. How can we possibly pass it on to someone else? And the Americans say, you can't give what you ain't got. We have to have this ourselves before we can convey it to someone else. We have to have received healing ourselves before we can pass healing on to someone else. We have to have suffered bereavement and grief and loneliness and broken heart ourselves before we can come put someone in the same boat. I believe this is why God allows it to happen. And then he brings us through it. Alcoholics the same, drug addicts the same. They're set free by the love and the power of God. And then they can go out and tell others, look, if it happened to me, it can happen to you. I was worse than you are. So, and Satan is roaming around the world like a roaring lion, seeking whom he made the world. Christ healed everyone they brought to him. Satan came to kill and to steal and to destroy. Jesus commanded his disciples to go out, proclaim the good news and heal the sick. The commandment still stands. It hasn't changed. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. His word is enshrined in the heavenlies for all eternity and cannot change. So this is what God wants for us. Abundant life, fullness of joy, peace that passes all understanding. Abundant life means more life than we can handle. Fullness of joy means no more room for any more joy. And the peace that passes all understanding. No matter how bad it may be, no matter how bad things may seem to be, God promises to turn it to a corresponding good. Romans 8 verse 28. God will turn everything to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means if you turn our depression into elation, or sorrow into joy, or poverty into riches, or loneliness into companionship, or sin into grace, or bondage into liberation, this is God's promise in writing. Now we either believe it or we don't. If we believe it. That makes the difference. When you pray believing you have received, that's perfect tense. It will be given, future tense. The belief has to come first. I meet hundreds of people. I meet thousands of people every year. I mean literally thousands of people. They say to me, I've been praying for 40 years. I've been praying and praying and praying and praying and nothing happens. Nothing ever happens. <coughs> they have already disqualified themselves. That's when you say nothing happens. That means you doubt. And St. James says, if you doubt, when you pray, you're like a wave tossed by the wind. Don't expect anything. Doubt disqualifies us. Doubt. God doesn't heal everyone. Some people he doesn't heal. I'm suffering at the moment with a serious back problem and I have to go in with some kind of an injection expensive. That's why I'm sitting on a cushion at the moment. So, um, and you know, he says it's better for a man with one eye to enter into heaven than with two eyes to be cast into hellfire. And some people are carrying their sickness, are carrying these disabilities, and they're an inspiration for others, because they don't even complain about it. They're quite happy and at peace with God. But the final analysis is that we'll be with him for all eternity. That's the bottom line. So, this is it. I believe that Christ still heals. He still heals. I see it happening every day, virtually. Of all kinds of sickness and disease. And I'm not the one who heals Christ is. I couldn't heal a pair of socks. And I keep saying to people, if you get healed when we pray, I don't take any credit. And if you don't, I don't take any blame. I'm not a healer. My son Simon, when people would bring up, is that the healer in Kilaini? <laughs> have you anything for arthritis? <laughs> Simon said, no, but we have a very nice line in Bob's repeat this year. He didn't laugh at the whole thing. I'll tell you about that later on. Anyway, to get back to the story, here I was reading this book, and it was a total revelation to me. And that was what changed my life. 
I paid devoutly for 31 years, crying in front of the statue of Our Lady, in front of the Eucharist. Jesus, come into my heart, come Holy Spirit. Nothing, nothing ever seemed to happen, because I doubted. The next morning I'd wake up and it was as bad as ever, and I'd say, ah, he didn't hear me this time either. I doubted. Doubt disqualifies us. Because doubt means a lack of faith, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. In fact, it's even worse than that. Anything that's not done in faith is sin. If you do something which is intrinsically good, and you don't believe it's good, you believe it's bad, then you're guilty of sin. If you do something which is evil, and you believe it to be good, you're not guilty of sin. God does not judge the act, He judges the heart. If you confess with your lips and believe in your heart, then what you think and say will come to pass. And this is the Word of God. We really do it and believe it in our heart. So that was kind of... And then he talked about the change that it made to the Apostles. You know, when they experienced the outpouring of the Spirit, and they went out and turned the whole world upside down, that that was available to all of us. You know, John the Baptist said, I mentioned this last night as well, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there cometh after me one who is greater than I, the Lord who shows I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I have come to set fire on the earth, why we should for already blazing. That's the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we receive in baptism and confirmation. We receive the inpouring of the Spirit, but we need the outpouring. And all we have to do is ask. Jesus said it. If your child asks you for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If he asks you for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? And if he asks you for bread, will you give him a stone? And if you who are evil are able to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 